Good morning and a warm welcome back after our recent short break to today's online Claver event. I'm Ian Rees, Chair of Claver, the Welsh People's History Society. This morning's session is a continuation of Claver's spring series on migration in Wales. As I know, many of you are already aware, we are dedicating the whole spring series to the memory of Claver President Howell Francis, who died in February. Before we get underway, can I, just one small housekeeping issue, can I please just remind you all to ensure your microphones are turned off during this morning's events. Thank you. Following on from uh, the three excellent sessions, which together comprise part one of the series on communities and people, today's event kicks off part two of the series, which is entitled Global Connections and Transnational Exchange. In this morning's session, we will be focusing on the development and impact of the Congo Institute in Colwyn Bay. Established in 1890 by the returning missionary and pastor, the Reverend William Hughes, the Institute was designed to provide students from different regions of Africa with an apprenticeship in religious nonconformity as well as opportunities for technical education. While the Institute had a relatively uh, short lifespan, closing in 1911, its legacy lived on in the personal journeys of the students who returned home to translate uh, the skills they had taken from their time in North Wales into their future careers and life experiences. So in order to understand the significance of the Institute and to focus on the lives of the students who were tutored in Colwyn Bay, we're delighted to welcome today's guest speakers, Marian Gwyn and Noba Embu Emputu, for an exploration of this complex transnational story. To share, share this session, it's my great pleasure to introduce Marian Gwyn. Marian is a historian with a special interest in the connections between Wales and empire. During her near 20 years of working for the National Trust, she was instrumental in challenging the way that the Trust interprets its properties connected to colonialism. As an independent consultant, she is currently working with the Trust to embed connections to empire into its public interpretation. Marin is also a head of heritage for Race Council Cymru, an umbrella organization for over 150 diversity groups in Wales. Last year, she was a member of the Welsh Government's Working Group, which published an extensive audit on the statues and memorials of Wales connected to slavery and empire. And this year, she is a member of the Welsh Government's Working Group, which has just published its recommendations for including the themes and experiences of minority communities into the new school curriculum for Wales. At our AGM in December, Marian was also elected at Slava's Executive Committee. Marian, we're delighted you're able to be with us today. Uh, many thanks for chairing today's event. Over to you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm delighted to be chairing today's session on the African Institute of Colwyn Bay, otherwise known as Congo House. Ian has given us a very good overview of the Institute. Um, but of course, that seems like a very nice, straightforward story. But its story is far more complex than that. Otherwise, we here at Lambert would not be looking at it. And the issues that arose around the Institute, the good and the bad very much resonate um, with today's political and social climate. Now to draw these out, I'm going to start the session with an overview of the Institute and of William Hughes himself. He gave his, his life's purpose, I think, to the Institute. Without William Hughes, there would not have been an Institute. And then after this, my friend and colleague Nobert Mbu and Putu will be discussing the students who attended the Institute and what the legacy of the Institute was on them and on Africa. Nobert is a Congolese journalist and writer. He is coordinator for the South Seas Project and he fled the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2005 after the authorities 
repeatedly arrested him over his work. He is a former UN worker and a former team leader in Africa of an international NGO. He has studied in the UK, in Belgium and in Congo. Um, he has a BA in film and an MA in philosophy and human sciences. Nobert has written a number of books, most of them in French, and so I will not embarrass, embarrass myself by trying to um, pronounce them, but they are available on the internet. Nobert and his Congolese colleagues have maintained a deep interest in Congo House and its legacy for many years, and it is such a pleasure for me to share this platform with him today. After this, we will be holding our usual question and answer sessions um, session, and I'm delighted to say that we're going to be joined by the Reverend William Hughes's great granddaughter, Jean Williams. So please, as ever, please use the chat facility to place your questions or comments for us to discuss later. And I'm sure Jean would welcome any questions you wish to place her way. So let me now start sharing my screen and I'll kick off with William Hughes and the Institute. So hopefully you can now see that. Now, our primary interest in William Hughes is his work as a missionary. We've already touched on the role of missionaries in a number of um, Sabbath talks, and inevitably this turns our thoughts to issues of imperialism, colonial expansion, Western paternalism, and so forth, as we now readdress our opinions of what empire stood for. And while some of these can be applied to William Hughes, as we shall see, and as Chris Draper notes in his book, he was very much, William Hughes is very much out of step with much of that imperialism, but he was very much in step with many of the black radicals who were shaping a pan-African alternative to the scramble for Africa that was taking place at the time. Now, much of what William Hughes stood and um, did at the Institute was governed by his own experiences of growing up in rural Wales and by his maturing awareness of his own Welsh identity. And this is the Institute here. And this inevitably influenced his feelings to what he saw was growing anglicisation of Welsh culture. And now to put this very clearly as to why he established the Institute was that he believed no matter how good the intent of the individual person or the intention of the group or organization of an external influence, a country should be able to manage itself and in its own language should it wish. Now, he was not anti English and he makes this perfectly clear because he writes this in his book. He says, it is wrong and a blunder to appoint Englishmen as judges, preachers and magistrates over the people of Wales. Even if they were the best of men, they should be in the wrong place. They did not fit their place. They are ignorant of the Welsh language and acquainted with the affairs of the Welsh people, their poverty, their history. And he believed that this applied just as much to the cultures of Africa as it did to Wales. Now, I'll be exploring this a little bit more about how this fitted in with his views on Christianity and evangelism shortly, but hopefully it'll all come together. Now, this is where he grew up here, just above Llanestindwy in Roslan. And it was here that he had his most formative experiences and what um, really influenced him to become a missionary. And it was through his experiences at this chapel here. This is Capel Abeirth, the poet's chapel, so called because of its connections to a number of famous poets. Now, Wales at this time, the end of the 19th century, was going through a period of radicalism and politicization. And the chapel movement, the nonconformist movement was central to this, especially in rural areas. The chapel was frequently the hub of cultural and social life in rural Wales at this time and well into the 20th century. And William Hughes attended many functions. These were usually talks by, by visiting preachers. And while this helped form his very strong Welsh identity, he was also influenced by another set of preachers. These were the missionaries or the former missionaries, and these were going around and they were telling all sorts of exciting stories of faraway lands, foreign travel, and of exotic people 
who they professed really needed to be saved. And this was when he decided to become a missionary. His first step was to learn English. He was highly literate in Welsh, of course, because he'd been brought up in the Welsh nonconformist tradition. Um, but he needed English to enter the Baptist um, College at the Baptist Missionary College in Llangollen. And so over a period of two years, and I think this shows how committed he was. He worked as a farmhand in Cheshire and then as a shop assistant in Manchester um, to make sure that his English skills were good enough uh, um, to enable him to enter the college, which he did. And this is or was the Baptist College in, in Llangollen. It later became a post office. The college itself is still going, though not in Llangollen, but actually in Bangor, um, which is very um, interesting. And so he was accepted into the college here. Becoming a missionary was no mean feat. We tend to think now that people would apply and off they would go, but it was far, far harder than that. Missionary societies had been sending their representatives around the world for decades by this time. And let's not forget that the Portuguese had been doing it since the early years of the 15th century. But the missionary societies knew that the death rate was very, very high. Before the arrival of quinine in the middle of the 19th century, 75% of missionaries sent to Africa died within two years of their arrival. The societies knew the rigors to which their missionaries put to, and so selection was very demanding in assessing both the mental and physical strength of the applicants, never mind their religious conviction. Now, the training program, um, it depended upon um, who your teacher was, but some of the basic skills that they were sent over with included not only religious instruction, but first aid, general medicine, sometimes surgery, carpentry, education, building, cartography, and, and so forth. Now, William Hughes, after he finished his training, applied to the Baptist Missionary Society three times for a posting to Africa. The first time he was refused. The second time he was offered China, which was considered to be a safer posting, but William Hughes didn't want China, he wanted Africa. And after much protesting, he was accepted on his third application. And he'd clearly done very well at the college to enable him to do this. And another sign that he'd done well was that by the time he left the college, he became engaged to the principal's daughter, Kate, whom he later married. And this is where he went um, to Congo. And you can see the mighty river Congo there. And the BMS, the Baptist Missionary Society, had many, many stations in that area and all along the west coast of, of Africa. And he landed here at the mouth of Congo at Banana, an active port then and an active port now. And he sailed up the Congo in a steamboat. And for those of you who've seen the film African Queen, um, then you'll know exactly the type of boat that he traveled on. And of course, camping on the back banks of the river each night until they got to the station. And this is where he arrived. This was his station, Bainston Mission. He, the head of the mission, sadly died of malaria, even though quinine was very good, it, it, it was, there was still a very high death rate. Um, the head of the mission died of malaria not long after Hughes's arrival, leaving him with sole responsibility for running not only the site, but also the community as well. Now, this little etching here was done in the 1880s when William Hughes was actually in Bainston. So if this is accurate, this is the, the settlement where William Hughes lived. Hughes soon began to question what he was doing there. Even with the best of intentions, was he doing exactly the same as he criticized England for doing in Wales? Now it's clear that his behavior was different to many other missionaries because he noted that local people stated that unlike other missionaries, he didn't throw their uh, non-Christian religious symbols to the floor, but he asked them about them. He wanted to know about them. And it's useful here for us to look briefly, I think, at missionary work in Africa. Missionary activity happened far earlier than imperialism, certainly as far as um, Northern Europeans were concerned, the nonconformists, you know, decades rather than the centuries of um, um, the Catholic missionaries. 
But by the middle of the 19th century, many were close to abandoning Africa due to the high death rate. But this didn't mean that they would have withdrawn Christianity because European missionaries had been training African missionaries from the very beginning. Each year, each missionary society, and I'm sure some of you may well have your own copy, used to issue atlases of their work with maps and illustrations showing all their stations and their work that their members were, were, were doing. And this was, of course, done with the intention of encouraging more, more missionaries to go out and also very specially encouraging donations that they needed to survive. Now, what these rarely mention, if they mention at all, are the African missions. And scholars such as Felix Mayer suggest that for every Christian, every, every, um, every Christian mission set up by a white missionary, there were by the end of the 19th century, nine run by black missionaries. That means for all the missions in Africa, 90% of them were run by black missionaries. And the vast majority of these were self-supporting. These were funded by money raised locally and donations of local materials and supported by local volunteers. African expertise was essential in ensuring that Christian concepts were properly conveyed in local terms that local people would engage with. Now think here of early Christianity in Britain when those bringing it in were encouraged by the Pope of the time to adopt pagan sites of ritual and calendar events, hence the fact that we have Christmas at our midwinter festivals. Now, if this is not to say, of course, that missionary, that white missionary work was irrelevant, um, especially as it was the white missionaries who first mapped the territories they went to, they learned the native languages, they wrote them down for this first time and generated a printing industry, not only in religious books, but in newspapers, um, which thrived in local languages along the west coast of Africa. And this, it was in this area that William Hughes thought that he could genuinely help by providing Africans with the training they needed to develop such things. And by setting up a training institute in the UK, the students could return to their homelands without external interference on how they did things. And also Hughes wanted to disabuse the UK of some of the assumptions that were prevalent at that time about Africans. Now, Hughes himself became very ill with malaria and had to leave Congo, bringing with him his first two students in Kansa and Kinkasa. Now, these two young boys had been with him at the mission and they returned with him to the UK with the permission of their families. And so he set up Congo House with his wife in Colwyn Bay. This is the first Congo House. As it grew, of course, it moved to the much larger building we saw earlier. Now, people always ask, why Colwyn Bay? He had nothing to do with Colwyn Bay before, before he set up the Institute. But there are two very specific reasons why he chose Colwyn Bay. The first was that it was in his, his, his beloved Wales, the land of the pure, as far as he was concerned. And it was also close to Liverpool because it had excellent rail and excellent sea connections. And of course, Liverpool is where the shipping from Africa embarked and disembarked. And as an aside, but an important aside, the Elder Dempster Line provided free voyages for all students to and from the Institute, which is excellent. And so the Institute went from strength to strength, enabling Hughes to move to a new, much larger building. And I'm not gonna discuss what the students did because Nobert's gonna do that, but just to show very briefly one aspect of their work, just to put it in perspective for you, they set up their own printing department, working closely with Paulson's printers of um, Colwyn Bay, but setting up their own printing works at the um, Institute. And we see Mr. F.W. Bond there, the leading tutor in, in printing. And here are some of the Christmas cards that the students produced. Now, it was at this time that Hughes wrote his book, Dark Africa and the Way Out. And in it, he sets out his vision for the Institute and how he felt that Europe could genuinely help Africa. Now, this cover is fascinating because the book is presented in such a way that it was a riposte to Stanley H. M. Stanley. Now, Stanley is currently seen in negative terms, but, and I know this is something that Nobert 
and many other Congolese feel very strongly about is that Stanley is a far more nuanced figure. And I firmly support this as well. Now, sadly, we don't have time to discuss this now, except to say that in this particular context, he was a showman. He knew how to tell a good story and that would thrill a white audience. And so Hughes wanted to portray a very different image of Africa and Africans to that presented by Stanley, as we can see here between you've got the darkest Africa there in the Stanley book, whereas in William Hughes's book, you've got them in education, in training, you know, because he firmly believed and he wrote they were the same as us in blood, in everything. All they needed was education and training, which, of course, he was um, committed to, to providing. And just to point out that Hughes and Stanley knew each other very well and Hughes respected Stanley very, very much indeed. In order to stimulate the ambitions of the students, Hughes invited many um, black role models as possible to speak at the Institute. These included not only learned people, but entertainers and performers, anybody who would be a role model for the students. And they included missionaries such as John and Matisha Ricketts from Jamaica, um, a former enslaved person from America, Thomas L. Johnson. Um, we had Sir Samuel, um, Samuel Lewis speaking there. He was the first African to be knighted. Um, he was of Sierra Leone. Um, Dr. T. Skoll, a Jamaican author, and Dr. Majola Agbebi, who we see here. Hughes's relationship with Agbebi is, is, um, is vital. He was a church reformer, and he was the founding pastor of the independent church in Lagos, the native Baptist church. He was a political agitator. He was Yoruba by birth, and interestingly, Agbebi stayed at the Institute um, many, many times, and he and Hughes developed a strong relationship that lasted over 20 years until Agbebi's death. And, in their, and as their relationship developed, Hughes felt that it confirmed his views that the modern, modernization of Africa should be self-led, and Agbebi supported this by writing that you could not transform white into black. The Institute was very well known along the west coast of Africa, and the editor of the Sierra Leone Weekly newspaper wrote, we want to show the world our appreciation of this noble work, which already is in earnest progress with beneficial results to Africa. And the Institute had far more applicants than it had places for. Now, why did it close? There's so much more because of time, we don't have time to go much into the Institute itself, but why did it close if it was so, so successful? Well, there were three principal challenges against it, two of which proved impossible to withstand. And they incorporate resentment, racism, fake news. Now, please remember that the Institute was wholly financed by public subscriptions and donations, and so public attitudes mattered, and we know how fickle those are. The first but not so potent reason um, that led to its fall was this man here. This is Leopold II, King of the Belgians. He had been a patron of the Institute since its inception. Now note that there was no financial connection between Leopold and the Institute, and he never visited. Um, it was just that the uh, Reverend Hughes felt that it would help to have his name as a, as a patron when Leopold was considered to be a fine person. Now, when news of the atrocities that were being carried out in his name emerged, um, his name was simply dropped off all of the um, Institute's um, documents, letterheads, etc. And luckily they survived this bombshell. But later on, when the other two reasons came about, Leopold's name was brought up more and, and more. Sadly, um, one of the two main principles why it was closed was because of the British, because of the Baptist Missionary Society itself. They had always opposed the Institute from the very beginning. They could not control it, and of course it was a very controlling um, society. And many individual Baptists made scathing attacks against William Hughes himself. And Hughes attended several Baptist Congresses in the hope of attracting official recognition of the Institute, but to no avail. 
The Reverend Benjamin Evans of Gadlistown in South Wales wrote, no missionary belonging to us in Africa and especially in the Congo is in sympathy with Mr. Hughes and his cause. Well, in actual fact, many of them were indeed. And one of um, Hughes's friends wrote, of which he had several, wrote, who was a Baptist missionary, wrote stating that he had been in um, BMS discussions where they'd stated that they wanted to crush William Hughes and his work, and that's the work, that's the word that he uses. And in the light of this, Dr. Akbebi wrote to Hughes, considering that perhaps England needed Christian aid from Africa. The, inst the Institute survived these attacks, but its income was severely limited by the work of the BMS against it. What finished off the Institute was the gutter press and the gutter man. Now, do remember that even though Ankansa and Kinkasa were both young boys, the other students were young men. There were a few females, but mostly men. They were late secondary school age at least. And what brought them down was the John Bull. Now, the name itself, John Bull, is a nationalist newspaper journal, if you can call it that. As you can see here, exciting stories, the trigger mist. And um, the most poisonous person behind all of this, you can see his name there, edited by Horatio Bottomley. Bottomley, what a wonderful name. He was also not only founder of the John Bull, but also founder of the Financial Times, uh, one of the founders of the Financial Times. And he was accused several times of stock exchange fraud. He was a man of boundless energy. He became an MP where he presented himself as the voice of the ordinary person in England. Doesn't this resonate with today? Now, luckily, he was eventually jailed for his crimes of insider dealing. But sadly, this was too late for the Institute. In December 1911, an article appeared in the John Bull entitled Black Baptist Brown Baby, when news of an illegitimate baby was born to a local woman and a former student who had returned to the Institute to help out. The John Bull tried to persuade the woman to say that she had been abused by a former student, but she stood her ground and insisted to the very end that the relationship had been one of mutual attraction. And this led to further articles accusing Hughes and his students of financial impropriety, sexual immorality and miscegenation. And the racism against the students and abuse against William Hughes is very difficult to read. One secret reporter um, had apparently visited the Institute and concluded that the students left with all the vices of the white man, but none of his virtues. And he went on, during the summer months at Colwyn Bay, some of the ladies, i.e. white women, act in an astonishing manner towards these, I will use the word students, not the words they use. They may be seen, they may be seen seated with them on the seafront in earnest, if not affectionate conversation. And when dusk arrives, black and white in italics may frequently be seen strolling together down the road behind the Institute. Now, sadly, and much, much more and far worse was, was written. Sadly, Hughes decided to sue Bottomley for libel, something he could not have hoped to win, but he thought that truth would win against Bottomley's bottomless purse. And of course, he lost and the Institute closed. Now, Hughes decided to go back to Africa in 1917 to carry on his work. He had returned in 1990 um, to promote the Institute for more students, um, but this would have been his third voyage in 1917 to carry on his work. But he was persuaded not to, as of course it was the Second World, as First World War, and German U-boats were targeting British shipping in case they were gun running. As it happens, the Elder Dempster line we now know was, was gun running, so perhaps it's a good job he didn't go on that. Now, while he was preparing for his plans, the people of Colwyn Bay issued him with a spectacular commendation. It's massive. The original is in Bangor University archives and there's a copy of it in Colwyn Bay Library. Um, now, because as well as running the Institute, Hughes was also an active counsellor. He, um, he was running both the Welsh and English Baptist chapels in Colwyn Bay and had been the general secretary on the committee that had brought the Nationalist Edward to Colwyn Bay in 1910. Now, while he didn't eventually go back to Africa himself, his time was not wasted because he was able to send 2,000 hymn books printed in Douala, 
one of the subgroup languages of Bantu. And so we have William Hughes, his empathy born of his Welsh experience of the anglicization of Welsh affairs had led him to believe that Africa should have indigenous missionaries who were not tied to foreign control. He did not consider Christianity to be culture free, but culture fluid. And he did consider that it held a universal truth that could save anyone who believed in it, whichever way they wanted, as long as they understood the gospels. If any of the cultures could help by providing training to those who needed it, then all to the good, but leave it up to the people themselves to manage it. And what of its legacy? What happened to the students? What did they do? Where did they go? And at this point, it is my pleasure to hand over to Nober Ambu and Putu. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's not uh, easy to uh, to speak after uh, Mariam. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I consider myself to be a, a Welsh Congolese guy because Welsh is the country I much know in the world. And because uh, when I'm in Welsh, it looks like um, it's a, a fish in the water because I can uh, start my journey from Newport to um, Bangor. Last time I did the Bangor, Bangor to Newport by bus. By, and uh, I can handle anywhere in Welsh without even uh, uh, booking an appointment. I just phone and I know where I will sleep, where, what I will eat. So this is really, um, it's my second um, country. It's my country, the country that where really I became uh, an adult. And uh, why really I became an adult also in Welsh? Because I feel that I'm much more connected to the Welsh history and to the Welsh Congolese history because I can't deny the Congolese history. From the Welsh history, it pushed me really to go back to dig more from also my history so that I put kind of what we call in Newport a footbridge, one of the wonderful bridge in, New, in Newport. So uh, I will share with you a um, couple of talk, uh, and uh, I think that in 20 minutes I can finish. Uh, let me go back to my, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, this history is very, very fantastic history. Um, uh, the history of just we learned from uh, Mariam of the uh, um, Congo and African Institute. And uh, I will just talk a little bit about um, what happened to those uh, uh, Congolese uh, uh, or those uh, um, uh, pensioners from Colombia when they went back in Africa. So I call it back home from home because it's difficult to know where is their home and where is their back home. And I call it change makers, it's change makers training. The change makers, it was a training um, um, made by one of the mentors of Barack Obama, President Barack Obama met in Newport also. In, when I'm in Newport, I meet, I meet with everyone, Barack Obama, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and so from Newport, I became really an adult. And the, the training, uh, the mentor of Barack Obama is doing around the world is how to become a change maker. And I think that what Reverend Hughes did in the Congo Institute is really to train change makers and really how this uh, went back. And I will really, that's the um, uh, last time I visited um, uh, Dublin, there is an interesting museum in Dublin, the Peak Islands. What is interesting about this museum is the museum of uh, uh, um, people who went and people came back. So it's very, very interesting to see, to see the, the, the crossover, how really Irish people, they left uh, Ireland and uh, how really they maintain their connection where, uh, with, with the, uh, their country. And they, they, they consider to be from both sides. And also there's another museum there, the museum even, I was surprising to see the museum of the veteran, the United Nations Blue Amulet veteran. Very, very interesting, most of them, you know, they, they, they fought in Congo, they died there. You know this film about the seas of Shadotville that uh, last year. Very, very interesting. So I think the, that is a really a vision for us, what we must do with this story 
probably to start thinking about, about to create such kind of museum. Uh, I will, um, some quotations, um, there is a, a proverb I learned from the Malinke people in West Africa. They say the one who travels no and learn more than the one who goes to university. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting all this period. Why? Because we are doing the revisitation of our common history. Uh, and um, so we got um, a kind of a challenge. Uh, after uh, learning about the story of the hunting by the hunter, it's important for us to learn also about the history of uh, hunting, but from the line perspective, the lines of perspective, and to put the two things together. You know, I mentioned about, uh, uh, Mariam talked about uh, uh, the history of Henri Morton Stanley. It's important for us to, 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 to listen to both sides of the story. There is a colleague journalist uh, who went back during the, the period of Mugabe, Robert Mugabe, who were, uh, was not welcome in, in, in the West. And he wanted to, to, to understand if Mugabe was an, an evil person or a saint person. And this film is very, very interesting, you know. He to, to, when he went filming Mugabe as a father, uh, you know, eating with his family and kids, portraying worse with a normal person. So, and so, so we, we are those who really who need to be able to put those things in balance. And another thing, uh, because Welsh, uh, you know, we just learned a couple of days ago the job uh, Marianne uh, did with uh, Professor. Um, um, Charlotte, um, about uh, to, 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 for the first time in the world, the, the black history, the black history will be in the curriculum. This is a very, very important uh, event. And I, I mentioned in this uh, online conference that uh, we need really also to teach this also in Africa because for the first time that I became connected to my own history is when I came in the West. So, so the light from the Welsh need really to burn, you know, the savannah uh, in the south. There is a proverb in my mother tongue because in Welsh, since I came in Welsh into Welsh, I learned every time I, I people they say, oh, you know, Welsh is just a small country. The Welsh is just no. In my mother tongue, a proverb say, a single match stick can burn the entire savannah. So to burn the savannah, you need just one stick. Of much. So, why really we keep saying, oh no, you know, Welsh is just a small country? No, a small country can also make a difference. Um, those are some archive really um, uh, about this history. Uh, Madame told, uh, uh, Madame talked about uh, this interesting uh, uh, documentary, the remarkable Reverend Jury. Very, very important. But you need, when you go to Bangor University, the archive is really, you have everything in, the, in this book, uh, even if we don't really decide that the, this title is not really the good title for the book. But this is a really, I will use most of the uh, information from this book, Scandal at Congo House, uh, uh, William Hughes and the African Institute in Columbia. Very, very interesting book. And uh, when, for the first time, we came across this history, we published uh, the book you can see there. And this is uh, one of the guys who visited Cooling Bay. And what is writing about this fantastic uh, journey to Cooling Bay is very, very interesting. Say, I'm ex 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 extremely grateful to you uh, for so. And he support really, it was so amazing for a, a, a a king from Africa who came in Britain by that time to visit Columbia and to say this is an interesting project we need really to learn from. And uh, I will mention also about uh, the 5th of December 2013, uh, it was the death of uh, Nelson Mandela, and there was uh, this article calling base history link with Nelson Mandela. And because people keep question why really um, in June the 16th of 1998, Nelson Mandela came in Cardiff, but there is a connection between uh, uh, Welsh and, uh, and uh, Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela was a unique link with Columbia Bay. The latest statement we did last year, this is the article from uh, this uh, um, newspaper. So, it's, so the, the guy who founded the college where I studied Nelson Mandela, I will come back to him. Really, it, it came 
from the to fund this college in Africa. So this is the history we never learn about it from African side. And the name of the guy is Davidson, don't go Jabavo. So this is an example of someone who came in Columbia and who went back and really who brought the light from the match from the Columbia to burn uh, uh, to put the light um, in his hand. Uh, I made this, um, I find those pictures. So, uh, and what is interesting about those pictures, you can see how these, all those people, people, they have their hair. And I will question myself, when they find this way of cutting their hair, and the first one in this was Jabavu, Columbia. Look, Nelson Mandela, 1960. The second one is Patrice Lumumba, who is the first uh, independent father of Africa and the Congo, assassinated in 1961. And this is one of the um, and, um, uh, um, Patrice Lumumba disciples. And look, really, all of them, it was really, and I'm questioning, is this one came from the Columbia? Probably this is the research we need to find. Oh. There is an interesting map uh, um, uh, drawn by um, uh, a guy from uh, Columbia. Is the pictures of, you know, you can see where all those students came from. So, of 87 students were trained at the institute during the 20 years, they were open, most were from Africa, but others came from across the Atlantic. And you can see the list of them from Angola, Bermuda, Cameroon, Congo, Grenada, Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Lesotho, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Saint Lucia, USA and Zambia. So you have the list. So all of them, they came. And what is important, a part of some who died, we'll mention about them, they went back home. And uh, so for me, you know, in the, um, the African literature, there is a guy, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who said, we are living in the world of the rendezvous of give and to receive. And for me, Kolung Bay, the institute, the remarkable uh, reverend use project in Kolung Bay, is really this rendezvous of to give and to receive. Those uh, students who came from their countries, they didn't came uh, in Kowloon Bay with empty hands. They bring something and they didn't went back with empty hands. So this is a really kind of a full circle of an interesting story. So what they brought, they brought their mother tongue. So almost 30 mother tongues in, in, in Kowloon Bay. They brought their culture. The Africanity, what uh, the, uh, the, uh, the actually the, the, the small two we met in the car, they explain us about the Ubuntu. You know, you are I'm, what I'm because you also. So there is a, a kind of solidarity. And also, also the songs, they brought also the way of entertainment in Columbia. They also the Pan Africanism because in history, it was the first time that we have almost 20 people together and to go back. So when those people, they went back, they also spoke about, uh, you know, their life in Columbia, about the country, people who live with them. So this is the, 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 the source of the Pan-Africanism, their negritude, whether we call the negritude or the negritude, the negritude is uh, the negritude of the migrants, it's for African people who, Leave um, a boat. But Apollo's, Apollo, the, 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 the um, Columbia Bay Institute is the road to African independence. Why? Because those young boys, those boys came from the, their countries, but these, their countries by that time it didn't exist. But even I use or trade them according to their origin. So this is really. Six years before the independence, there was a guy in Columbia, a remark, the remarkable Reverend Youth, who put the idea of them in the head of those young people that look, you are from your countries, and they were known for uh, as coming from X Y part of the world, and what they brought back to their country when they went back. Of course, Welsh and Welshness, English and Britishness, they brought religions, they brought garden parties, 
cricket concerts entertainment you know for example um, um, the, um, the singers the songs the new spirituals in the, the lower congo where the reverend used was uh, living in the, uh, the um, uh, station of vunda they still sing today some of the translations of the the, the gospels and i will come back about the disease so because Luckily, we met in uh, I found a friend of mine, a lady who lived in Cardiff, which grandfather was a pastor in the same uh, station of Vunda. And she showed to us uh, some of the copy of the translated the song they learned since they were young. And incredibly, that I live with her almost 10 years, but I never know that she's from, from, from Vunda. So they brought back history, they brought back the education, they brought back you know, many things they learn, carpentry, printing, mushroom, they build church houses, but they brought back also the pan Africanism, the negligence, the independence, the resilience. And I say they brought back in, a, in their country the progressive, uh, uh, progressivism. You know, for example, when the Reverend used to build this, the tabernacle church, kind of an independence church. So those young boys, those boys who went back, they brought these ideas of the independence. And there's a story that four of them, you know, they started in Liverpool in 1904. 1904 was by the same time that was founded the Congo Reform Association by uh, um, Edmond Morel, who fought against King Leopold II, the bloodiest um, uh, um, enterprise in the Congo. So those four boys who were students from Poland, they set up in Liverpool by this time. The Ethiopian Progressive Association. Can you imagine? So, and you have uh, some of the press about uh, really how really those uh, boys uh, and uh, and the student of Kulung Bay was really entertainment people in Kulung Bay. What they was organized there, very very interesting event. Uh, how we, they they were part of Kulung Bay community. They were they were really part of Welsh community. And uh, because it, when they came in Kolumbia, Bay, as um, uh, uh, Marianne mentioned, you know, the students received a broad range of training at the Institute to form a standard school education and the Institute itself through the apprenticeship in the community. Here, they learn a variety of different skills to take back with them to Africa and to America. The Institute became a model of the excellence for Africa and America. A Columbia newspaper reported that Mr. Hughes has planted a fruitful idea. Already, the Bishop of Sierra Leone has established a technical school on Africa soil for the benefit of its people. And Marianne mentioned about it. So, so when those people they went back, look what they learned in the Columbia. So it was a kind of a roundabout between really a very progressive uh, uh, um, highlight education, because most of them became doctors and whatever, but also the practical way of doing things of, you know, to typesetting the, you know, the Christmas, to, to print the Christmas cards, you know, clap on the water. So all those things, they brought them back where they are from. Most of the students stayed in Kulung Bay for three years before returning to their homeland, while others went to study for further qualifications elsewhere in the UK. After living in the institute, for example, uh, Ladipo Oluwole from Lagos at medicine at the University of Glasgow before returning to Africa, where he was responsible for setting public health standards in Nigeria. 20% of the students went into professional occupations, such as law, teaching, and medicine, and further 10% became high, uh, uh, high educated preacher and pastor, and also returned to work within their own community in the trade and in the business. I start uh, by uh, uh, Mr. David Sondon and Tengo Jabavu. Congo House's most famous student is David Sondon. Tengo Jabavu. He was one of the founders of four hair uh, college in South Africa, the first institute in Africa to educate, educate the black students. Jabavu went on to teach and mentor Nelson Mandela, South African first black president. So this is the map of 
some of them, and just some of them who went back, what really they did, you can see there, the doctor, first Nigerian medical officer, head uh, ministers, dubbed in Sierra Leone, teacher in Nigeria, newspaper manager in Sierra Leone, barista in South Africa, teacher in South Africa, missionary in, in Congo, nurse in South Africa, dubbed in Nigeria, barista in Nigeria. So the, the list is very, very long of really, you know, I mentioned that in 90, you know, when he went back, he set up the, the in, uh, uh, um, um, it, it as a printer at Columbia, he ran Sunday school and a small print department in Freetown. But in 1895, uh, Alfred Tungo uh, de Bundun from Cameroon, uh, William most loyal correspondent, he meant, they maintained the link we, and in the archive, you can see the letters, they, they were really written to the institute and the, to inform it to them. 1990, uh, which owners left in 1904, went to Nigeria, interviewed use, and was appointed the editor. Uh, so, you have those examples of all of them when they went back home, they really did something for their communities and for their countries. Uh, we mentioned about Dr. Lapido Olohule, um, who went back in Nigeria, who became doctor there. I can mention about uh, Oyejola, Oyejola, who had the first hospital in Yoruba land. So, so, and you can see also the way really I mentioned about the way they was cut in their hair by their life in Columbia. Unfortunately, a small number of students became ill and died before they could return home and they are buried in Columbia. And, and so in the cemetery there, we most of the time go back there to uh, uh, um, pay tribute to them. Um, and this is the cemetery in the old Kulun Bay. Um, and um, now there is a, a job, the job, and I say, is ongoing common history. We need really to continue to learn from this history, to tell this history, but this history is not well known. And we are very, very happy that now in Welsh, that uh, the Black History Month will be in a Welsh curriculum. And we need to work in this declaration of History. We need to make this history to become a part of history. And if we are talking about history, it's not only the, the, the writing source, the oral source. I was in the Midwest where I was talking about uh, you know, the Congo voice, and someone told me, look, um, in our chapel somewhere, there is something from those boys. So everywhere, I'm sure that in Welsh, you will find uh, the Congo uh, Institute uh, and the Grand Huge History. And um, I'm talking about the oral history. This, those are the, uh, in uh, Congo, uh, where I was living, living I was in the Congo. It's Congo. We say Salome Panda. It means the job just starts now. And I was myself surprised when I was doing this research, when I met, for example, uh, Mrs. Rita. I, I, I will not find the, the grave and the location if I didn't meet by chance in a bus stop, Mrs. Rita, who look at me, and this is, you need to live in a world where really someone just who does not know you. He just saw you say, hello, are you okay? Are you looking for something or someone? And this is my history with, with, with Mrs. Rita. She brought me to visit the grave, to visit the institute. And uh, as you can see there, uh, uh, Jenny Williams, uh, Nag Hughes, uh, the, the relative of uh, Reverend Youth, they got history in their family, they need to tell us. And ourselves, we came back to Columbia on my uh, right side. It was this friend, Frederia Musangi, who first taught me about the Congo books. I never learned about them. And he told me, look, when I was uh, studying in uh, um, uh, Kent University, I saw a small um, newspaper and I had it up. And I'm reading this book now. So because you are living in the West, so could you find about this story? And that's what's the beginning of this match that 
And we also um, work with uh, my friend, Dr. Um, Florent Poum, who is from this area, who went back home to this area. You know, the mountain uh, uh, um, Mariam show us in the beginning. So Dr. Florent went back there because we want to really to, to, to know what happened what was done there and the history of the missionary in this area. We also found that in the same area near Vula, the mission of Balaba, Balabala, where really they got the first black uh, female uh, doctor who came from America to work there. And is considering this village to be their son. And, and uh, as I said, um, uh, one time in in Cardiff, uh, I was surprising to meet a friend there, a lady, who was a pastor in the same uh, uh, parish where a station of, of Vunda. But there is something interesting. Uh, what is interesting, the Congolese community published last year, because last year was very, very interesting in African history, because uh, almost 17 African countries celebrated their 60th anniversary of their independence, and the Congo also. And for the first time, the Congolese community decided to publish the first Congolese community in the UK manifest. And if you are reading this manifest, we Congolese community in the UK decided, and one of the recommendation of the decision is, you can see the decision 4-4, to establish a Congo-UK celebration day in May of each year to commemorate the presence of the first Congolese in the UK, Olumbe, with graceful, graceful singing, grace uh, the necessary fund for the establishment of the Congo and the African city of Wales, wherever they are uh, used. So we decided in the community that we need really from now to celebrate this fantastic history of this fantastic history of the Congo and African Institute, but also to continue to dig what happened to those who went back. And uh, I will end up with uh, this uh, quotation from the last letter of uh, Reverend William Hughes from the Institute. Do not forget to remember me. Love West, the earth. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Norbert. Now I can see a hand up by Jen. No, his hand has just gone down. Now, may I just ask, I can't see Jean's name here unless she's using somebody else's laptop with another name. Is Jean Williams here? William Hughes's great granddaughter. It looks like she hasn't been able to join us. I'm very sorry. I know she was very excited about joining us right now. It's This has generated a lot of conversation. I'm delighted to see that. So if I start at the top now, lovely one from uh, Petronella Moanda, and she wants to know, um, and she's very interested in sharing this with the Congolese community in Liverpool. And I think that would be excellent. Nober, what's your contact with the Congolese community of Liverpool? Yeah, um, I've got a lot of um, uh, contact with uh, Liverpool because most of the time, for the first time, I travel with the Congolese from Welsh to Liverpool to visit the uh, Slavery Museum and especially the second compartment about the black achievers. And um, so most of the time when I come back from, from North of Wales, uh, I go to, call, uh, to Liverpool, visit a friend, to stay with a friend. So uh, let's get in touch and then really we, there are a lot of material. And there is a, a big connection because, you know, there is still of North Wales Connected to Liverpool, you have there is a, a lot of connection between Liverpool and the Congolese history. So there is a, a work, a job to do there to dig very important, really. Uh, mm. 
Thank you. Now, you also asked Petronella about having a copy of the presentation. That's actually quite difficult regarding um, copyright of images and things like that. The, um, there is a recording of this presentation, of course. There is also, some of you have asked for more information, there's also the book written by Chris Draper with photographs by Jonathan. Uh, I've forgotten Ray. You can't remember. Oh, that's awful. Um, but anyway, now that book um, is called uh, Norbert puts a photo of it up on his screen. It's called Scandal at Congo House. Now, that is because um, it ends with, of course, the story of the um, John Bull scandal. Now, just so you know about this, because it is important, the book itself contains a lot of very useful information. I've spoken to Chris several times about this. Um, when he took it to the publishers, it had a different title. And they did not think it was exciting enough and they didn't think it would sell. They didn't think the story would be um, attractive enough to people if it went under the ordinary name of Congo House of Colin Bay. Um, and so the publisher insisted on changing it to Scandal at Congo House to try to make it more sexy, to try to attract different people. But also very interestingly, so Chris was telling me, was that they also, the publishers also wanted to take out the biographies of the African students that are in it, which because he said nobody would be interested in them. Now, I think that is absolutely appalling. I think it's absolutely dreadful. Um, but the book actually, despite its title, actually contains a lot of very useful information. There's also a little film on YouTube that I produced with funding acquired by Learning Links International and um, funded by Colwyn Bay Town Council. Um, and if you Google on YouTube, um, uh, the remarkable Reverend Hughes, there's a little film about Congo House there. Um, so now the next question asked by Howell Davis, even the first Congo House seems an impressively large building, absolutely. How was he financed with the purchase of this and the later house and its activities? No, not, the, not from the BMS, not at all. Now, the first Congo house was also run as a B&B. &B, and what was fantastic was in Kansas and Kinkasa, they actually helped serve breakfast, which, of course, the guests absolutely loved. Um, and also, from the very beginning, William Hughes, went out, drove around the country, not drove around the country, but traveled around the country. He gave talks. The, the boys in Canada and Kinkasa, they went around singing and reciting in Welsh and in English and in Nobe. Would their indigenous language have been uh, Kikongo? What language would they have spoken? Kikongo. It was by that time the Kikongo. Kikongo, yes. So they were going around speaking in Kikongo as as well. So the initial funding came from dint of hard work. Um, when they, as popularity for the interview, because don't forget it was doing a lot of very good work, they did have a lot of public subscriptions. They were, um, um, some of the missionaries who were visit, visiting and some of those other people that I mentioned earlier on who were visiting Congo House were actually traveling around the UK giving talks, raising money from it's noted for example that from one of um um, um like baby's talks that he gave um around britain he raised something like 200 pounds which was a lot of money then um from one of his talks to support the the institute and we need to mention also when um, um sarah Henry Morton stanley um john holland from Denbeef came to give uh, his first talk uh, in welsh in uh, uh, the castle of Canafo in front of uh, 4,000 people. All the money he raised there, uh, he gave it also to uh, the institute. And uh, we just uh, um, found that now in the um, uh, Welsh uh, Museum in Cardiff, for example, that this is the big, the, the big connection between 
uh, um, um, a Welsh migrant uh, to Welsh. Um, um, Harry Morton Stanley, for example, received a gift, a golden gift from Queen Victoria, and he gave this gift to Welsh. And this gift uh, is uh, now in the, in the in the museum in in Cardiff. So, uh, Reverend Hughes did this, uh, and this one I say that everywhere when you will go in Welsh, you will be surprising to find the kind of a story as when I was in mid Wales, someone told me in our chapel, there's something there that uh, Reverend Hughes come with uh, the black uh, um, boys in our chapel by this time. Let me take a picture and show you. So, and I think this is the first of these projects is the projects uh, funded by Welsh people. And yes. all these people, they did really, and they, they supported the project even when they was working, for example, in the carpentry or uh, printing, it was the local people who supported the project. Absolutely. And what Nobert mentions there about printing, don't forget for everything that the students were actually making, they were selling, they were tailors for the community, and um, they weren't just printing Christmas cards, but anything, raffle tickets, posters, they were running a proper printing business because they then it's surprising when you look at how many of them go in to become um, editors printers when they go go back and so they were skilled to the point that they were able to sell their 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 work now uh, another question from petronella um about what's happened to congo house is it in use now yes yes both the congo houses um, the little one, I think, is just a, a domestic house now. I mean, a big house. Um, but the institute itself now is a it's on um, Nanta Glen Road in Colwyn Bay. And it's a hostel now. It's a hostel. It's a very large building, but you can drive up to it. Look, you know, look at it. It's a spectacular building. It really is absolutely superb. What do you think of it, Nobert? Yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting. We, we... The building is still there, and uh, if really you go back a century ago, how really, and this one I like the title of Marianne uh, documentary, the remarkable Reverend you, how a guy could a century ago have this uh, revolutionary idea to buy this big house and to sell. So it's, it's, it's a century ago, if you check the building today, and say, how really a guy got this idea? This, and this is making the Reverend used to be a revolutionary guy. And, um, and that is really why we need to find where those boys who live in these houses, in houses went back. Those who were attending, for example, he started, for example, the Tabernacle Church. And most of them, when they went back, they set up Independence Church. Uh, and uh, when we came with the Kimbangisi Church, the Kimbangisi Church is the first. Uh, Independent African Christianity uh, set up by Simo Kimbangu, who was uh, uh, Christianized by the first uh, missionary of this um, parish of Vunda, uh, so the um, fellow of Reverend Yul, and he set up the Kimbangism. That's why we came with uh, them to Colin Bay, because they, they say we, we learn from those missionaries to become ourselves independent and to set up our independence Christianity. So this is really, and this is how we really need to click in our brains. Now, one thing that a very good question asked here by Howell Davis is that given the unexpected hostility of the BMS, could Hughes not have sought the support of the Baptist Union of Wales instead, especially given his own sense of Welsh identity? Now, I've had a quick look at the Baptist Union of Wales, and I'm not sure when it was actually set up. I'm sure people are better informed about this than I am. And I think more than it could possibly be that um, Hughes very much saw this as missionary activity. Um, and that he always wanted to align it. Because very interestingly, Hughes, at least I think is on two occasions actually offered the, in, the Institute to the Baptist Missionary Society. So, but they did not want it, despite the fact that they were trying to, they just wanted to wipe it off the face of the earth, which I find startling um, because, because it's very interesting because Hughes never 
again, you know, at the, the point I made at the beginning, he wasn't anti-English and he wasn't anti-Baptist Missionary Society. He wasn't actually anti-anybody. He supported everybody in the best way that he could. And he very much wanted to align the Institute with the British Missionary Society because he thought it was very much the sort of thing that they should be supporting. And it certainly proved itself, but the, the um, BMS, just took a stance against it and, and they, they would not move. Regarding the Baptist Union of Wales, that's very interesting. I haven't been able to find anything about that, but I will certainly look, look that up. That's a very good question. Thank you. I think that we, we need to dig also about the relationship between the, the Baptist missionaries um, and the, the other Welsh. Uh, I just, uh, I'm reading a work of someone I'm sure that is in uh, uh, the panel. Um, um, uh, about uh, another independence uh, protestant uh, um, uh, missionary group set up in Congo, and uh, it was set up also by um, a, a Welsh guy living from a, a Welsh guy from Cardiff, who received also money from uh, some businessmen from Cardiff, and they set up in North of Congo in Bolobo and where. So it's very very interesting. I was surprising to learn. Uh, really, how really Welsh people, Welsh missionary, uh, inspire really the kind of independence church in 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 Congo in Africa. So this is really the piece of work we need to to dig more to learn. You know how really, and I think from Welsh side also those stories are not known. Uh, and this is why I'm many 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 times when I go to the museum, I say to them. Please, you need to really to tell this to the stories because we just find in a, a, a museum most of the missionaries when they came back they brought also a lot of piece of art and some of them have never been uh, uh, disclosed. So there is a work that needs to be done there to find where those arts came from, and um, so the, we got the material to work on it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, thank you. There's a very good, there's a very interesting comment here from Megan Monroe, who says, interesting to see two students came from Lesotho, as Wales as and Lesotho are now twinned, and they are both mountainous um, countries. Absolutely right. Um, a question here from Georgina Gittings. Um, will the history be in the new Welsh curriculum? Absolutely, of course. Um, now, the chair of the curriculum um, was of course Professor Charlotte Williams, um, who will be speaking uh, in a few weeks weeks time um, on one of these Sabir um, sessions. She's she's just superb. She has been aware of the history of Congo House for for some time, and um, the way that the new curriculum is um, has been devised is that nothing nothing is prescribed for teachers, but they will have access to a list of resources. And so information on Congo House will be there. Obviously, it's up to the individual teachers to pick up on it, but there will be recommendations as to what will be good resources, um, um, et cetera. So teachers will be encouraged to use this story. Yes. Professor Charlotte William mentioned in the book, um, Welsh Dekula uh, I think there is an interesting paragraph um, writing there about the, the the graves and and um, so uh, uh, and she's from this area, so I'm sure that she will be really be one of those who will really speak about the the, the Congo and African Institute uh, history. Thank you. Yes, and another comment here from Liz Millman. Brilliant presentations. This is a fantastic fantastic story. Thank you. And it was Liz Millman who spoke to the um, local library in Colwyn Bay who got some books of um, Congo House and started a um, reading group on this story there. And they produced some work as well. So excellent to hear that comment. Thank you. And then, yes, oh, lovely from Ben Curtis. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Nobert. Lovely. And Easter blessings from Howell. And a lot of people are asking for the name of the books and the... Um, we'll put the link up to the video as well in the comments if, um, right, any more questions? Yes, from Megan Monroe again, good to hear the positive views as the scandal book is rather negative about William Hughes. Well, actually, 
I would say that the book itself, it's just the title. Chris Draper has done a lot of excellent research in, in his book. Um, and he presents William Hughes himself in a very good, good light. It is just the title of the book. And I know that the family actually contacted the um, publishers um, direct to speak to them, but they, they refused um, to engage with the family about this title. Um, now, um, Chris didn't really want to challenge the publisher um, when they put forward a different title, but he did. Um, oh yes, the the link to the film is up. Yeah, thank you. Um, but he didn't actually yeah, want, when they wanted to. Do, I'm sorry, no, you take over. Yeah, it's important because um, uh, when we invite um, one of them uh, in uh, Landino, he made an interesting talk. And that was the first time for him to be invited to talk about the book, and uh, you will. The, the first thing is the contrast uh, between the talk and the title. And then you need to understand that uh, the title was really a suggestion of the publisher. But the content of the book is the first time that someone was working, a local historian, to take all those material. And uh, so really, when you read this book, uh, check the picture in the beginning and uh, read the book. Forgot about this title, no? but you need to understand that the title was made really just for the publisher to attract people to buy the book. But the, the content is one of the wonderful because if you go to um, Bangor University in the Hive, you will find much info information there. You surprising, to be honest. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And on that excellent point, Norbert, I'd like to draw the session to an end. I'll say thank you to you all and hand over to Ian. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marion. Thank you, Norbert. On behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to extend our grateful thanks um, to you, Marion and Norbert. Such an engaging session and offering us such fascinating insights into the Congo Institute for Colin Bay. Really absorbing to hear about the radical Welsh non-conformist background and advanced uncolonial perspective of uh, the Reverend William Hughes and about the varied lives and experiences of the student uh, change makers who studied at uh, Congo House. Brilliant stuff. Many thanks also to you, the audience, for your comments and questions via the chat function. If um, any of you would like to stay on Zoom after the event for an informal chat or to ask further questions to our speakers, um, you'd be most welcome. Um, one more important thank you. Many thanks to James, Sean, Darren, Moena, Matthew for all their help in organizing and publicizing uh, this event. As I mentioned at the start, um, today's session is the first in part two of our spring series of online um, events on migration and Wales. Very much hope you'll join us for session two, uh, which will be held next Saturday again at 11 a.m. and which will be entitled Religion and Liberty. The event will be chaired by Erin Bell and our guest speakers will be Hannah Thomas and Richard Allen. Details of how to sign up for the event can be found on our website and also on Slava's Twitter and Facebook pages, and they will also be emailed out to members in the coming week. As I'm sure most of you are aware by now, if you've missed any of our previous online events from 2020 or 2021, recordings of all our events are, or soon will be, available via the Slava website. A recording of today's event will also be uploaded there in due course. Um, if you find your way to our website, you'll also be only a couple of clicks away from becoming a member. You'll find details of how to join under the membership tab. It only remains for me to say thank you uh, once again for your support. We look forward to welcoming you back next Saturday. Thank you very much. Thank you.